You guys should see yourself from here. This is unbelievable. My name is Regina, and I'm a believer in recovery for drug and alcohol addiction. Thanks. I was born into a family that most people would say is perfect. And to be honest, I have a wonderful family. And my parents and my brothers and sisters support me in virtually everything that I do. My father's a pastor, and my mother stayed at home to raise my older brother and my younger sister and myself. But much of that perfection that we lived in changed in June of 1988. That's when my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer and began treatments. I was just eight years old, and I can still remember the day she came home from the hospital. My father helped her up the stairs and into her bedroom and onto the bed. My brother and sister ran in and jumped on the bed to see how she was, and I just stood in the doorway. I didn't want to go near her. I didn't want to touch her. My, bro my father sat my brother and sister and I down at that same time and told us that our mom was sick and that I needed to help take care of my younger sister. And I believe that's when my little mind began to think that I had to take care of myself because the mom that always had was now unable. My mom survived that cancer, but until recently, my family rarely spoke about that year of our lives. My childhood was filled with a fair bit of moving, both houses and schools. I was in five different schools and five different houses by the time I was 10. Making friends was never something I was really good at. And my childhood summers were split between my grandparents' farm in Kansas and my summer camp. When I was, my church summer camp. When I was 12 years old, that's when my life began its downward spiral. It was at summer camp that I smoked marijuana for the first time. I can honestly say I loved it. All I could think about was doing it again. After I started school, I continued to smoke marijuana. Started, you know, once a month, but within a few years, I was smoking every day and I discovered other drugs. And just like that first time with marijuana, I never thought twice about doing other drugs. I just did them. And it was only a matter of time before I was dealing some drugs as well. The difficult part of this lifestyle is that I was a Christian. I truly love the Lord, and I wanted to live my life with Him in my heart. Over the years, as my drug addiction grew deeper, so did my love for the Lord. I can remember sitting in church one night and the pastor quoting a Bible verse. This is a verse that I've since chosen as my life verse. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. It's Romans 12, 2. As the pastor quoted this verse, I can remember an instant conviction setting into my heart. It was like for the very first time, I was uncomfortable with my lifestyle of drug addiction and Christian living. I realized that God was not and never would be pleased with that lifestyle. Go figure, I was a little slow. <laughs> Over the years that followed, I started a career in veterinary medicine. I worked in oncology and orthopedic surgery. I was on leadership teams at church, taught Bible studies, mentored young women in their walks with the Lord but I also had a deep battle with drug addiction going on inside of me. It seemed that no matter how deep I got into God's word, I couldn't find freedom from my drug addiction. I went to church leaders and shared with them my problem, and I was always given the same answer. Pray harder, read your Bible more. I didn't understand why that didn't work. My double life continued, and the deeper I got into a relationship with the Lord, the deeper my drug addiction went. I was sitting in church one Sunday morning in, in, 90, in 99, and the pastor was talking about a missions trip to Romania. I knew deep in my heart that, I, that God had called me to be in Romania that summer. And this, this decision to follow God's will in my life proved to be the beginning of the end of my drug addiction. It was through praying for that trip that God made it clear to me that I couldn't be a missionary and a drug addict at the same time. I know, you'd think I'd have gotten it the first time, but no. <laughs> Once again, I went to my pastor. I told him the struggle that was going on inside of me and what I was living with. He and his wife helped me dispose of my remaining drugs and paraphernalia, and they kept me at their house while I went through detox. 
When I returned to work after detox, where nobody knew of this double life I was living, my morning started out with putting an old dog to can with cancer to sleep. Here's where I start to cry. <laughs> Her name was Amazing Grace. As I sat in the exam room with Amazing Grace's owners, I asked them how they came up with her name. They looked at the doctor and they asked him if he remembers what he had said to them 10 years earlier when they brought him to her, brought her to him. He kind of laughed and he said, yeah, the same thing I've told you over and over again through the years. She's a dud. You shouldn't have kept her and the price that you spend on her isn't going to be worth the time that you have with her. Amazing Grace's owners looked over to me and replied by saying, what if God had said that about us? We kept Amazing Grace because we could look past the price and see that she was worth it. We showed her the same grace in keeping her that God showed us by dying for us. I walked out of that exam room with tears rolling down my face, and I've cried every time I've told that story since. And I knew God was in control of my life, and just that one more seed of his greatness was planted into my heart. I stayed clean for months following that week. I went to Romania and into Hungary, and a passion for reaching the world began to grow in my heart. When I got home, I was given, my opportun uh, given the opportunity to share my testimony with 1,500 college students. And that was an experience that showed me that God will use my life of struggling through drug addiction and Christian living. However, within a month, I was back, engulfed in drug addiction. The binge that followed was the worst I'd experienced to date. Why, once again, was I using when God had intervened? I've asked myself that over and over and over. I began to realize that if I was working towards a goal, like a missions trip, I was able to stop using. But once the valley of normal life returned, I didn't know what to do with myself. People continued to tell me, pray more, read your Bible more, but it was not enough. My journey from that time was filled with moments like these, weekly prayer meetings, followed by using drugs, leadership teams, Bible studies, with the drug addiction running inside of me. I began getting promoted, making more money, but still, the addiction, the addiction ran deep. It wasn't long before reality began to set in. I wasn't going to be able to live my life without a substance. I honestly believed that was going to be my life. It was pure insanity. Just weeks before going on my next missions trip to Israel and Jordan, I hit my bottom. I left work one night, walked through our treatment room. I took a bottle of ketamine and a needle. Ketamine is an anesthetic induction drug used in animal hospitals. I used a couple of times that week, and then I met some friends at a, at a hotel on the beach here in Orange County for a weekend of prayer and meditation. As we were praying together, I had what I can only explain as a vision. I saw, I saw the hand of God reach out to me, and I was standing alone, and his, his hand reached out. And as he reached out to me, I took a step back. And he took a step forward, and I took a step back. And it seemed like the closer God tried to get to me, the further away I wanted to be. When I opened my eyes, it kind of scared me. I didn't know what that meant, but as I looked back, I realized I should have taken it a little bit more seriously. I returned to work the following week, and that Tuesday night, left work, walked through our treatment room, grabbed a needle and syringe, and went home. I remember the first few seconds of a high, and then I remember nothing. I woke up in the emergency room. I'd been unconscious for some time, and I found out that my mom had used a hammer to break into my bathroom, where she found me unconscious with no pulse, the result of a drug overdose. I spent hours in the emergency room that night. About 25 of my family and friends came to visit me there. 
That was almost harder than the overdose itself. I didn't want people to see me that way. And most of all, I didn't want my little sister to see me that way. She just stood at the end of the emergency room bed and stared at me. The fear and the disappointment was still in her eyes. She had no words. I'll never forget the way she looked at me. Another person that stood out to me that night was the, the ER nurse. She never looked at me with disappointment. Instead, she took me by the hand and told me that the waiting room is filled with people who love me and that that was more than most drug addicts had going for them. The result of that overdose, I lost my job at the animal hospital, and I was facing misdemeanor and felony possession charges. I finally hit my bottom. It now became a decision between life and death. A couple of days after my overdose, a family friend told me about this thing called Celebrate Recovery. <laughs> you might have heard of it, I think. I didn't really know what else to do, so I took that long walk up the parking lot and sat in the chemical dependent group that Friday night. Just weeks after that overdose, I found myself on a plane to Israel. I was terrified to go there, come back, and stay sober. History had shown I couldn't do that. But it was in Israel that I made the best decision of my life. I was in En Gedi, an oasis in the Israeli desert. And as you walk up to En Gedi, you see two huge mountains and this crack running right through the middle. And I was told that if I walked through that crack in the middle of the desert, there was an oasis at the end, and it was the most amazing miracle I will have ever seen in my life. So I started to walk. And they were right. I mean, you should have seen it. it you, I was in the desert. There was a dry riverbed. There was these giant rodents running around. There was dead plants. There was, it, it, we were, I was the desert. There was nothing. It was dead. But suddenly there was water in the, in, in the creek. And then there was a living plant. And then there was a butterfly. And then I saw a goat running across the, the mountainside. And before long, it was waterfall after waterfall after waterfall. The colors of green like I've never seen in my life. And in the end, there was a waterfall that looked like it fl was flowing from nowhere. It was amazing. That night, I spent the night in a Bedouin camp, and as, the, and as the sun rose in the morning, so did I, and I climbed a little hill outside the Bedouin camp and began to reflect on my hike in En Gedi. Though there was no sign of life or water, I walked that hike in En Gedi because I was told that there was a miracle at the end. I chose in that moment to believe what people had told me about Celebrate Recovery. If I just start to walk through it, I would see a miracle at the end. I would be the miracle. When I returned from Israel, the Lord provided me with a support system. I jumped into recovery with both feet. I started a step study, I got a sponsor and accountability, and I started reading my life recovery Bible. Before long, I was doing court on possession charges. The Lord was in the, room, in the courtroom with me that day. Some of the charges were dropped, and I never had to see the inside of a jail cell. I continued going to celebrate recovery and working through the 12 steps and eight recovery principles. Principles one and two, those were easy for me. I knew I was powerless over drug addiction, and I knew Jesus Christ was my personal savior. It was with principle three that the Lord began to work in my heart. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. I realized that though for years I'd been serving the Lord, I had never turned my will to the Lord. I was still trying to change my life by my own power. I began to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2 as a command to serve God under his direction, not my own desires. Serving at Celebrate Recovery for the past few years has completely changed my life. As I work through the, the eight, 12 steps and the eight recovery principles, I've been, 
I've been able to begin to forgive myself for the wreckage that I caused in my family. I was able to ask forgiveness to the people that I'd hurt through those years. I've seen relationships with my family restored. My sister has become my best friend. And I'm now able to be the kind of older sister she can look up to, not take care of. The Lord's begun to res restore the relationships with my parents. And I was able to stand by my father's side and hold his hand in 2003 when he had emergency open heart surgery. In May of 2004, my mom was again diagnosed with breast cancer. And instead of running away from that relationship, I was able to stand beside her and be there with her when she went through treatments and surgery. When I got to principle five, I was able to look at myself and the changes in me that hindered my relationship with God and others. I began to see that a poor self-image that I had caused a struggle with anorexia. And with God's help, I've been able to see myself as his child, the way he made me. Over the years, I've been slowly working through principle six, making amends. In February of this year, on my five-year sobriety birthday, thanks. Thank you. It gets better. I made the long overdue amends to my mother. I apologized for who I was and the things that I'd done for her and for not loving her through those, those years as a drug addict. I handed her my five-year sobriety chip. And for the first time, I thanked her for saving my life. With tears running down her face, she looked me in the eye and told me that I was her hero. This program truly changes relationships. It's step 12, principle eight, that I've enjoyed the most. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and my words. These last few years of serving at Celebrate Recovery, I've handed out bulletins at the door on Friday night. I've co-led a step study. I've facilitated our Friday night newcomers group numerous times. I've led our women's chemical dependence, dependent group. And sharing my story of recovery and freedom through Jesus Christ has taken me all over Southern California into multiple states. In the summer of 2004, I traveled throughout Malaysia and Singapore speaking in churches and talking with pastors about Celebrate Recovery. I spent last summer volunteering in a drug rehab center, leading step studies, sponsoring girls, and listening to Fifth Steps. In March of this year, I moved to San Salvador, El Salvador. I flew in for the summit. I'm heading back when we're done. I've been teaching the Celebrate Recovery principles to a rehab program called Teen Challenge. It's there in El Salvador that I've spent the last five months teaching weekly step studies and walking between 40 and 60 ex-gangsters through the very principles that saved my life. The guys that have been going through, celebrate, through the Celebrate Recovery Step Studies have for the first time been given the chance to work through the wreckage that their drug addiction caused in their life. One of the guys that lives at our facility, Ramon, even without knowing about the existence of Life Hurts, God Heals, came to me and asked if he could teach the material at a local youth center in an effort to stop those kids from walking down the wrong path. I've also met a handful of pastors, one of which looked at me and with tears rolling down his face, he said, Regina, I attended Al-Anon Al as, a, as a child, and I've been trying to figure out how I can teach those principles to my congregation, and this program is an answer to those prayers. I 
I don't, I don't share these things with you to boast, because apart from what God's done in my life, I'm nothing. But I share these things to inspire you and to show you that the Lord has not forgotten about my desire to reach the world. And he has indeed used my life to share his love and healing. After not being able to get more than a few months of sobriety, in February, I celebrated five years of sobriety from drugs and alcohol. It's a feat that could have only been done through following the Lord's will. I've walked through job changes, sick parents, the deaths of friends, and I've learned I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. <laughs> Amen. I no longer have to live in bondage to substances, negative feelings, or the words of others. I can wake up each morning, commit my day to the Lord, and get the strength that I need for that day from Him. And I want to end by challenging you guys to find ways that you can make Step 12, Principle 8, part of your recovery and make it your life. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs>